everybody, and welcome to episode 65 of the I Rock Knits podcast. My name is Corey Eichelberger, and you can find me on the internets as I Rock Knits, and I Rock is just Corey spelled backwards. I still like my new opening music a lot. When that little chime comes, <laughs> comes in, it just, I'm editing, and it just makes me kind of happy. It's pretty. It's got a little spunk to it. So I hope you're still enjoying it as well. And in the last couple of episodes, I have included a lot of new um, introductory slides and pop-ups that are newly made. And a lot of you commented that you like those. So thank you very much. I did purchase a brand new video camera this weekend to use for the podcast so that I don't have to tear the dining room table apart every time and set up the stool with the <laughs> kind of... I don't know, it's just not a great setup. And it would be really nice if I could put a tripod on the other side and zoom in a little bit. And we got it home and there's no remote. And I really can't with my new foot <laughs> run around the table and back and around the table and back. So instead, Ross helped me set everything up again. And we will take it back and get the one with the remote. We thought we got the one that had the remote start and stop. That way when I get interrupted, I could just pause and I wouldn't have to maybe do quite so much editing. So we're back to the old iPad for one more week. We did have to buy a new computer this week. And while we were there, we bought a new flat screen, little tiny TV for the office because we were still using an old black box with a video cassette recorder <laughs> down below from when my daughter was little uh, in the office and in the, you could, see it and hear it fine and when you're working on the computer sometimes it's just nice to have the news on or something in the background but the screen was always quite yellow it's getting yellow people faces were yellow. so we kind of amped up on that too and Ross got it hooked up and boy is it nice to have that connection in my office where I spend most of my days writing knitting patterns right now so we we did a whirlwind exchange of you know technology and we will turn our old computer into the Geek Squad on Saturday and they'll upload uh, all the stuff. It's really hard to get an appointment for someone to do that um, because everyone's on the computer and having upgrade problems. I did get a malware, some type of um, virus on my computer. My Facebook account got hacked a couple weeks ago. If you follow me over there and you got a video um, messenger for me that said have you seen this and it was a video that was the hack that was going around never open those <laughs> and you know what it came for me so many of you may have opened it um, I recognized it right away as something that I hadn't sent but it kind of played tricks with our computer we have protection we have web root on our computer and our security and I got this flashing screen last Saturday that said you have a Trojan where shut down, shut down, call this Microsoft number immediately. Well, you never know, never call those numbers, right? <laughs> so I hollered to Ross and he said, oh yeah, we're in trouble. Something, something's in the computer. So we haven't had a chance to figure out what it is yet, but anyway, things have been a little technology um, dependent at our house lately and we don't have the technology we need to run the things. What am I wearing today? Today, uh, this is also our shawl or cowl of the week, and I'm going to talk about it a bit here, right at the beginning. This is the Love Letters, um, which was a knit along, so it's called Love Letters M K A L on Ravelry, and this was a collaboration between two independent dyers and four knitwear designers. It was a great idea two years ago that didn't really come to fruition in the way that all the people that were involved thought it would. <laughs> so by Leading Men Fiber Arts and Three Irish Girls Yarns, and they each dyed mini skeins for us to use, and then Megan Williams, Just Run It, Telly Bean Knits, Stephanie and Paper Daisy Creations, Lisa, and I spent the month of December on uh, chats trying to figure out how to design a product where everyone would be involved. And there were some great stories around this, but we each took a section and then 
sent the directions to the next person. We each knit our section. I happen to be number four in the mailing. <laughs> so I kind of got the short straw where everyone else had, you know, like the first person could just start however they wanted. Anyway, it turned out to be lovely. I'm going to untie this. The I cords were my addition along with the top, but this is how it looks. It has this pretty scalloped edge that is worked back and forth at the bottom. And then we added a eyelet row and then some diagonal purl stitches and then the chevron stitches, which um, is so typical of Megan's work. You can just see that that's Megan in there. And then I added, uh, we did another section of the show, and then I added this I cord at the top, and then this really fun two color I cord bind off. And it was for Valentine's Day. It was a ce celebration of friends and friends together. So on the end of this one I cord, I have a little heart. So uh, it takes four mini skeins, four coordinating mini skeins. So we had. Um, two from each dyer and yeah it's kind of fun to wear it can be worn a multiple you can pull it up over your ears kind of as a hood because it's quite long then you can tie this in a bow you don't have to do the eye cords I'll put some pictures on the screen So this is what it says on the pattern page love is in the air this project is a celebration of of collaboration. This is one cowl created by four designers with yarn crafted by two dyers, all for singular knitting pleasure. The Love Letters cowl has an unusual construction knit from the bottom up. This cowl is first knit flat and then this little part you go back and forth. I um, wonder if I can. It's just tiny in the back and then it's thicker in the front. Does that make sense? I don't want to take it off and put it back on again. <laughs> um, this cowl is first knit flat and then worked in the round. Like a great first date, this cowl takes you on an adventure using lace, texture knitting, slip stitches, and a decorative bind off. You love knitting this, you will love knitting this friend project. This pattern was originally published as a mystery knit along. When you download this pa pattern, you will receive a getting ready guide and four clues. You can download each section individually or print them in a single document. There is just one size and you need fingering weight yarn in four colors, about uh, 50 gram skeins of yarn, and you will not use the entire yardage of these four skeins. Yeah, they used a superwash merino, and it was knit on a size US size four and a US size six, 22 stitches to four inches in fingering weight, and it came out in January of 2018. And I was going through, um, I have a bench, uh, like, you know, box of, uh, yeah, it's a bench with a flip top that, so I could sit in the window and watch for someone to come and pick you up or whatever. And it's red leather, pleather probably. And I have all my extra samples in there and I was digging for something the other day. And this came out and I thought, oh, that's perfect to wear for Valentine's Day. I should, I should have that on. So if some of you have some speckled yarn in your stash, that would be kind of fun for this section. And then you cast on and then work, you know, in, yeah. So I thought I would share it today because we're getting close to Valentine's Day and it's kind of in the spirit of the program, doing collaboration with, with different people. Um, the problem with doing that is there were so many cooks in the kitchen, right? Because you have ind independent dyers who dye differently and have different ideas for what colorways they do. And then you have four d designers who are all different in their aesthetic and how they work and so it was really challenging which is probably why we've never done it again to just get you know because three Irish girls there are there were at the time two different dyers and then um, leading them fiber arts has two different dyers so and then there were four of us so we really had a ton of people working on this but it is available out on Ravelry Google um, or search in Ravelry love letters mcal it will come up and it's six dollars and you might like to have a little extra fun with some color in a cowl. I think people are often looking for things to use mini skeins for. I have been listening to an audiobook but it is one that I can't really recommend um, highly. 
It is called The Ghosts of Gold Mountain by Gordon H. Chang, and it is our, our book club book for this month. It is our nonfiction read for the year. The subtitle is The Epic Story of the Chinese Who Built the Transcontinental Railroad. So if you're really into trains or you live in that part of the U.S. where they were doing the construction, especially out in Arizona, California, where they were blasting and doing, you know, all that really early construction techniques, you might have an interest in this. Uh, I'm just really struggling to get through it. I'm not sure that I will actually finish, but I don't know that a lot of people will come to book club and say that they really enjoyed, you know, this is probably a story that we should know about. Apparently, there are no known written records from any uh, person of Chinese descent that wrote anything about that time. They don't, there are no books written. There were no journals that they found, um, not a lot of letters. So they, he did a lot of research, but it's not based in like personal, you know, narrative. So I just, I just move on. I'll probably start a new book this week and go to book club next Monday and see what people have to say about it. Uh, your recipe of the week this week is going to be a little clip that I'm going to insert uh, here. I made a red sauce starting from tomatoes and if you've never done that before it's a really fun process whereby you take all different varieties of tomatoes that you either get at the grocery store or from someone's garden um, in the fall and you bake them in the oven and then blend them together and add some seasonings and I took some video of each of the steps of my process and how I go about doing that and then I made a recipe so I will um, insert that here. I'm roasting tomatoes this morning so I thought I'd show you how I do it. A little onion powder, a little garlic, salt, olive oil, and then I just do a big roll around. Of course, you know my right hand is not working right now, as well as <laughs> it should. So I just get them all full of oil and into the oven they go. Okay, into the oven, 400 degrees, about 15 to 20 minutes. I will take the cherry tomatoes out early if they start getting too done. Sticking them off into the blender. They're all done. These are quite juicy. Uh, I won't say all of that because it's mostly water. But these are got a whole about I don't know. Um, not a half of the blender is full of cherry tomatoes. Now these go back in the oven for a little longer. Okay, all done. Sizzling hot, all roasted. I'm gonna let these cool a little bit because I like to make sure that the core is all soft. Like this little piece right here might need to be uh, cut out if it's not going to blend up well. But usually they're pretty good. Okay, now I just chuck these and scoop them in. I'll do all the aromas first. You know, there's one that's got... So, usually I use my fingers, but I, uh, I just check to make sure that that's going to blend up really well. Uh, I've just gotten a couple of hard ones in the past, and so I'm gun shy. <laughs> okay, just leave one to eat because they're delicious, just like this. You need to add a little sugar because the tomatoes are so acidic. So I usually do a tablespoon um, in something like this. it it's just beautiful just lovely 
I don't mind leaving it a little chunky. You can liquefy it completely if you prefer. Taste and season. Salt, pepper, sugar if necessary. I make that sauce whenever I'm making chili or pizza sauce or spaghetti sauce. I often use it in soups. So I was making a uh, chicken tortellini soup where my husband likes the meat in it, but it could certainly just be a tomato-based tortellini soup. I didn't make my own tortellini, I just added it. Um, and then it's got some other things in it, but I'll put that recipe as well in the Ravelry group for both of those items. So if you're interested in doing something like that, I think a lot of us are making more home-cooked meals than we did before because we're staying home more than we did before. And so you might be interested in that. I got a lot of tips and tricks for you guys today. They're all short and sweet, um, but uh, I'm going to just kind of bang through them. Somebody sent me a picture, a friend, a neighbor who knows that I knit, sent me this picture on um, the internet the other day, and I'll insert it here, but it's basically someone crocheting. She saw it on Facebook or something off a toilet paper roll that is holding a spool of yarn that's on one of those cardboard things, but you could certainly stick that center through a center pole ball. If you are having trouble with runaway balls that go every which way and you don't have a um, yarn bowl or something to kind of secure it in a basket sitting on the floor or whatever, you might think that that is clever. I thought it was kind of funny, so I thought I would share it with all of you. Um, I had a couple of people comment on um, making center pull balls by hand if you don't have your own ball winder. And one of the ways in which I found out on YouTube some videos, so I will link a couple of videos where you use a toilet paper cardboard holder or a um, paper towel holder and then you cut a little slit in the end and you stick your yarn through and then you start winding on an angle and then you just continuously turn and when you get done you take that little piece of end out of that slit and it will be coming out of the center of your ball so that's one way in which to do it and then another lady said that she used her um, tall prescription bottles which you could just purchase one from your local pharmacy, but then she sticks the tail in the top and screws the top on and then winds on an angle. And you can see that winding technique on those YouTube videos, but you're actually just not winding straight around, you're winding kind of an angle as you turn it. And then when she's done, she takes the lid off and that kind of pulls out of the top of her prescription bottle. So I thought those were both um, kind of clever, and if you haven't found those yet, um, I think YouTube is just a wealth of place uh, of knowledge to find places that you can have answers to the things that you need to know about. You know, you can you can Google just about anything, and a YouTube video will come up. So that's kind of that's kind of fun. On the topic of YouTube, I have a notification. Someone commented that they are no longer getting an email from YouTube when a video goes live. And that happened in August. But if you are just now realizing it or recognizing it, YouTube got a lot of complaints because people's mailboxes and little ping, ping was going off all the time if you subscribe to a lot of videos on YouTube, you would get uh, email notifications. So you no longer, as of August of last year, receive an email notification, but you will get a screen notification if you're on a device. So if you're on your phone or your iPad or your computer and somebody puts a video up that you are subscribed to, it will come up at the top of your screen in a little white dialog box and that is how they notify you. Otherwise, if you want to see whether or not you have new videos to watch, you have to go into your YouTube, your little page, and go to the notifications. And then it will list out, these are the things that were posted in the last week, these were the things that were posted yesterday, or these are the things that were posted in the last two weeks so that you can go through and see what you have that's new but you have to go out searching for that if you're not on the internet when it goes live then that's your way of finding out where those things are by going to your own page going into your own notifications 
And unless you're on the computer a lot, you wouldn't even see those notifications come up anymore. They would be in your little notifications box that somebody has. Or on the front page, when you open your screen, it will give you things you've subscribed to that have just been posted or things they think you'll like. And I get a lot of those things. You know, you watch a, a, a clip about a baby and then suddenly they think you're having a baby. <laughs> In that little box on the front screen in the right hand corner are three little dots. And if you click on those dots on that front page, it'll give you a list of things to click on. The top one is not interested. <laughs> so you can get those off your front page and you can tell the algorithm that you are not interested in baby videos anymore just because you happen to watch one. You do not want the front page of your feed to give be recommendations about baby so, videos or gymnastics videos or dance videos or whatever you've happened to watch then they start recommending those for you so you can turn some of that off a little bit by just clicking on the not interested box up in the right hand corner touch those three dots that that's how i do it on my ipad i'm certain you probably do it with a mouse on your home computer i got a gift in the mail this week and, and I got a little letter and I'm gonna read it to you because it has to do with a tip or trick that I gave you all a few weeks ago. Hi Corey, I'm Ian Kuhn and my wife Betsy owns and runs Elgin Knitworks. I make the cord keys that you featured on your show. Just wanted to send you a quick note to express my gratitude for the kind words you shared about the tools. I really enjoy making them and it means a lot to me that people use and appreciate them. We've been working on getting on our online store up and running. Your episode was a real kick in the pants to get it going. <laughs> And it is live now. So far, we just have some tools up there and we'll be adding more items in the coming weeks. Your program has resulted in orders coming in from around the country and we thank you for that too. We appreciate you. Kind regards, Ian and Betsy Cohn. So I got back to them and said, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to blow up your website or make people, you know, call. Uh, that was right before Christmas, I think, that I shared that. And so I went out and looked and the website does have the iCord uh the key cord tools out there but he got in touch and said we've just sent you something colorful in the mail and i got another key cord and it's purple oh my lands look at how pretty that is oh it's just awesome i'm so excited about that so he's gotten some of that purple wood and this is to insert in the little hole in a interchangeable needle set so that you can tighten down the needle on the cord. So if you do not have interchangeable needles, you would have no need for this. I have multiple sets of interchangeable needles and mostly because I bought more tips and then I buy more cords if I break a cord. And so I've just got this kind of package of a lot of them that I keep next to my chair and sometimes it is really hard to get that cord on tight so this just slips right in there and you can use that little silver one with the little loop on the end but you lose those all the time because they're so tiny it's like a stitch marker they go flying off and you got 16 under your chair and you can't find one right so I just want to thank Ian for sending me this I have no other relation to these people I just loved that I got one and bought one for a friend for Christmas and then he wrote me that nice note and then I felt kind of bad that I had shared it and that everybody thought that they were great but I they weren't upset they were just not prepared and so they do have them up on the website now and you can go ahead um, and purchase yourself a key cord that's what it's under cord key it is what it's under on the elgin networks.com website under shop you have to go to their their shop so that was kind of fun a couple of people chimed in last week or two weeks ago that i was talking about the shepherd's pie recipe and how someone had sent me a message that shepherd's pie made with lamb is called shepherd's pie but if it's made with other types of meat it's called cottage pie and apparently I said if you knit it with lamb as opposed to if you cook it with, with lamb and two people pointed that out to me this week um, that and they were very kind about it and just laughing and saying you know that they noticed that I said it that way and of course I said knit I use knit as my verb all day long 
all day long. So that was kind of funny. Um, okay, let's talk about the new projects in the room, shall we? <laughs> I have a new set of knitwear designs coming out tomorrow. And if you're on my newsletter list, you will receive an email from you, me with a coupon code uh, telling you that you can get all three okay. items for a discounted price. So um, I'm super excited about finally getting this design out there and off the needles. This is called my Betweenity set. Between. I-T-Y. That's how you spell it. And betweenity means between two other items. And I uh, saw that in, I bought this little book. I should show it to you guys sometimes. I went and grabbed that little book that I was t talking about earlier. This is the little book of lost words. Collie wobbles, snolly gosters, and 86 other surprisingly useful terms worth resurrecting. So um, it's by Joe Gillard. And I just, I love reading each of the little blurbs. So it has um, a picture. And here's the Betweenity page. So we have the guy over here. And then it has the word. And then it says noun. It has the pronunciation between nitty, 18th century English, being in the middle or between two things. He was in a state of perfect betweenity, faced with the choice of pizza or Chinese food. <laughs> so they use it in a sentence and yeah. So there are all kinds of interesting words in Rap here. Scallion, quanked, that's a funny one, quanked, uh, adjective, 19th century English regional diagnosis, exhausted or fatigued from hard work. That, that's for every mother in the world out there, right? They're quanked. There you go, Q-U-A-N-K-E-D. Then they got this guy who looks tired. <laughs> so that's where the bet betweenity word came from. And I just thought it was kind of fun because my orange is between the red chevron. I designed this hat. I'm not gonna be able to hold it up because of my hands because this is a glass head and it's kind of heavy. So I will take it off the head in a minute. But because I had this orange section between the red chevrons, I decided to call it between. This is a hat, cowl, and mitten set using my Corey's two color cast on. Of course, that's optional. And two colors of cord corrugated ribbing, also optional. You could shorten up the corrugated ribbing by just using one color or you could do fewer rows of the two colors. I do include a knit uh, to knit to in between there so that you don't get that little pearl blip as well as when you're changing color on the top of the cowl you do and there's a note in the pattern and a, in a actual video sh showing why someone would do that and then it's just a standard decrease top on the top of the the hat so that's the hat it isn't quite as bright as it's showing up I think the glare off my bright gold <laughs> shirt today is making that orange so I wrote the hat for a number of sizes and the cowl um, is in two lengths the shorter length and the longer length this is a whole nother um, set and so I used brown sheep sport weight yarn again it comes in those 50 gram balls which i just love because it makes it less expensive to purchase and then you can um, use more colors if you do not have sport weight a heavy fingering weight will do as well as a light dk weight you will still be able to get gauge with either one of those so don't fret over the fact that you might not have sport weight in your stash you can probably get gauge and then just, even if you can't get gauge, you could adjust your numbers a little bit. So many of you know how many stitches to cast on for a hat for yourself or whatever in worsted, you can just go up and down. And then the, here's the mitten. It's all in the same concept. So the mitten's written for five sizes um, from children all the way up to extra large. So like a man size mitten um, or just a woman with large hands. And because the mitten width from here to here is not very tall. It is not a perfect match to the cowl or the hat because there's not enough room to fit two red chevrons 
unless you do it down, go down farther into the hand. And I wanted this to be an easier to knit mitten so you weren't doing the thumb gusset increases at the same time as you had color work going on because then you have to strand the color across the gusset. That can make it really kind of a pain to fit because if you get a lot of stranding happening there and, and you're increasing. So I purposely just put one chevron on the mitten. If you're knitting the adult um, large or extra large, you can fit the bigger chart on the mitten if you would choose to. You could just start it a little bit sooner and then have it go up into the tip a little bit. So I have the set on sale. You, you're going to be able to purchase each item individually on Ravelry, Etsy, Love Crafts, and my website. If you want to do one item each, you can do that. If you want to buy all three in the set, you can put them all three in your cart and, um, and get the whole set at one time. They will be on sale for Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, February 2nd, 3rd, and 4th, 2021, Central Standard Time. They'll go on midnight, 12.01 tonight when I'm uploading the podcast, and then go off on 12 o'clock midnight on Thursday, February 4th. I'm just super excited. Amber did photography for me. Heidi was the model for this particular set. Uh, I have had testers do a ton of colors. So if you have the ability to go out on Ravelry and go to the Betweenity cowl or Betweenity hat or Betweenity mittens and look at the testers colors, you will find just extraordinary color choices. The reason that I chose the orange and the red with the dark gray is because many years ago, a friend went on a trip abroad and brought me back some mittens with a, a pattern really similar to this done at a finer gauge. And I have an orange wool coat that I got on clearance. <laughs> of course, it was on the clearance rack. It was orange at Nordstrom's at the Mall of America when I was shopping several years ago and I loved that I had those mittens to match that coat but I always wished that I had a cowl or a scarf or hat to go with it it would just have been a nice set to have so I designed my own and used the colors that were in those original mittens that I had and you can always turn a cowl into a scarf you can knit it in a tube in the round and just make it longer or you can leave it flat and have the color work showing on the back side. So that is always an option for people to turn cowls into scarves if you're not a cowl wearer. Original yarn that I bought, the lighter gray and then the orange was really, really more of a rust. And this is really soft and it's on my project page. So this is the longer cowl would hang, not quite twice as long. Not quite. It's knitted a little tighter gauge. So I did open that gauge up a little bit. And so this one's a little narrower. And this one just has plain ribbing. So that's an option for you as well. If you're not a color work knitter, you don't like doing corrugated ribbing, you can always do plain ribbing. I did put my Corey's two color cast on and bind off on the edge of this. So you don't have to do that either. You can cast on with gray, do your ribbing, and then just work the color work in this section. I do highly recommend that you go up a needle size when you work the mittens in the round in this small circumference. Most people on a small circumference have a tendency to do color work a little too tight. You know, it's that's just, it's kind of the nature of the beast that you're going around in a small circle and it's harder to kind of pull those floats open. So I do have a note in the pattern that recommends that you go up a needle size on the mittens for this color work section. A lot of the testers had that issue where it just really pulled in and they had to block it really hard. And you know when you, you can pull color work but then it gets to the point where you're pulling it and it's getting kind of open and wonky. It doesn't look very good. So I just wanted to be really cautious for people that if you don't ever have a problem with that on a smaller circumference, then don't worry about it. But if it kind of rings true for you and like, oh yeah, that might happen for me, 
because I'm using Magic Loop or two circulars or DPNs and that's what happens on that a small. If you've ever done color work on a sock, it's that same concept. The circle is so small that it's hard to keep those floats very, very loose. Um, I will show you um, the inside of the hat. These are my floats. I did carry my color up from space to space, but I wrote a, a thing in the note that you can certainly cut your yarn and weave in the ends and start with a new piece of yarn. So there you go. That's my Betweenity hat set. I will mention here that I often uh, text late at night with um, someone, you know who you are, who has also been recovering from some surgeries this year. And she was asking me about, or telling me about how there are certain patterns that she wouldn't knit or that she might not ever make and that she felt bad that she wouldn't buy that pattern from me. And you know, that, I know some of you feel that way, like you might feel like the need to buy every pattern and you certainly do not need to. But it is a way to support the podcast and that's what I was telling her. If you choose to purchase a pattern from me knowing full well you will never use it or you'll never knit it, but that's your way of supporting financially me on this podcast, that's nice too. Some of you have said, I just bought this to support you. And that is really kind. I, I just wanna thank those of you who did it. I did get a coffee um, from someone this week on the KOFI account and I wanna thank that person for sending me just a little bit of money to buy a Diet Coke because that was just really nice of them. And it made my day in the moment when it pinged on my phone, I was like, oh, I got a little, you know, kind of a thank you from someone. So those things are always appreciated, but never absolutely necessary, right? I put the podcast out for free. I don't have uh, any aspirations right now to put out a Patreon or do, you know, any type of fund thing that you can give me other than having that access to that Kofi. So I have some things I have to tell you this week. And one of them is that Brown Sheep Yarn Company is out of white yarn. <laughs> I don't think I caused that, but um, if you ordered yarn for the plaid blanket uh, and you, you got a notice from them that they ran out of their I think it's called half and half is which is their white yarn I, I apologize that you can't get it and it's it's kind of back ordered they make and spin and process their own you know there's a actual mill there and we did have that situation in November where they had run out of of white yarn you can find their yarn at retail shops you do not have to purchase brown sheep yarn from brown sheep so if you Google it on the internet, there are shops that actually carry their yarn. And I did find a couple of skeins of white back in November from a shop in California and she shipped it right out to me. So if you're desperate or really don't want to wait, um, I just want to put that out there that they sell yarn to lots of yarn shops. And so you can also find their yarn at other places. I did have a couple of people reach out about knitting the blanket in worsted weight instead of holding the DK weight double. And that is absolutely fine to do that. But you can't use D uh, worsted weight held single and get the same result. You could knit it, but you're, you're going to have to change your needle size and your gauge is going to change because it's going to be a smaller item on a smaller needle and then you're going to have to cast on more stitches. But my test knitter... Victoria on Ravelry. So if you go to the projects on Ravelry and there aren't that many yet, she knit hers in worsted weight held double and she used several different kinds of worsted weight and her notes are out there sure. of hers is there. So if you want to go and look at Victoria's on Ravelry, I'll look up her Ravelry name for everybody. It's Queen something and I should know it by heart. Her Ravelry ID is The Queenly Knitter. And she knit hers using Patton's North America Classic Wool, Lismore Sheep Farm Worsted, Plymouth Yarn Worsted Encore, and two of her colors. So for those of you looking for um, any information, you know, like a picture of what it, it doesn't look 
much different because she knit it with worsted, got weight double and used the same needle size and it worked out just fine for her. So I just wanted to also put that out into the world. I had a couple people say that they were concerned about knitting it because of the big needles and it does use a 10 and a half needle. And here's my theory on big yarn, big needles and people having hands that hurt. I often hear this with I when I knit with cotton as well. But we are knitters who use fine gauged yarn and finer knitting needles all the time. And we have built up the muscles that love knitting with that, right? So if you're a sock knitter, your hands have built muscles to knit at that small gauge where you're pinching and you're using those small needles. And then you all of a sudden go up to a bigger needle and you don't have the muscle for it, right? You're, you're engaging probably different muscles in your hands. And so I do think that it's important to swap out different weights of yarn and different needle sizes often in your knitting. I don't think it's ever a good idea for someone to just exclusively knit fingering weight yarn on, you know, size two needles, right? And just be like, this is where my happy place is, because those repetitive stress injuries happen from things like that. And with the recovery of my hands right now, I have four projects on my tray. I have this white, we call it a TV tray, but it, it flips up and down for storage. Um, and it's got white, um, it's not, they don't have, it's not the crossed legged TV tray. It has white poles. <laughs> for lack of a better term. Anyway, I have a bulky weight, a worsted weight. I'm doing a worsted hat with yarn held double. And then I have fingering weight, fingerless mitts. And I am rotating and resting and stretching and rotating. So that I think is something that if you know that going in, that your hands get fatigued, it's probably because you haven't used 10 and a half needles in a long time and you're using muscles differently in your hands. So also think I'm not gonna grip it in the same way, right? When we move from knitting a sweater on wool to a sweater on cotton, we have to remember that we have to change the way we work with the product, just like in sewing. When you sew on one kind of fabric and then you move to sewing on a different kind of fabric, you have to change some things around. The same thing with our knitting. I've talked about that a little bit before, but it's good to re remind everyone that if you're in the habit of only knitting hats on size eight needles forever and ever, and you just are banging out hats for Christmas, then all of a sudden your hands start to hurt because you're working on socks. It's probably because you've overdeveloped the, I'm, you know, I'm not a physical therapist. Let's ask some of those. I have some of you out there. If my theory on, you know, muscle and what muscles you're engaging in your hands is true. Okay. So, Michelle, Bonnie, who else? We have a couple other people out there that work. Oh, there's someone else too. Um, the name's not coming to me, but some of you work exclusively at medical clinics with people with hands. So <laughs> let me know if you think that that's, that's true, that we just have more muscle development for the thing that we use all the time. Interesting Corey story for you this week. Let me pull this letter over here. Every year I get a Christmas card after Christmas from my middle school gymnastics coach. And many of you are aware that I was a collegiate gymnast. I did gym gymnastics um, from the time I was eight years old until I was about 20, um, ending in a couple of fairly significant injuries. So the person who really started me was a male physical education teacher, couldn't think of the word, when I was in elementary school. I think his name was Mr. Byer. And he did after school gymnastics and I fell in love. And I was pretty flexible, but I wasn't as flexible as Valerie. Valerie was always the most flexible girl in elementary school, but we would stay after school and we would practice and then we would put on a little show. And so I fell in love. And then when I was in middle school, if you were at all athletic, you did all four sports. So you did volleyball and gymnastics or basketball or in track. And um, 
kids that didn't do well in gymnastics and basketball, or if they were good at basketball, they didn't do gymnastics in the winter. I think that's kind of how it ran. So I always did, you know, the, all those sports, but I started having success in gymnastics in middle school where we would have city meets and I would win ribbons. And then when I got to high school, um, as a sophomore, I was uh, on the varsity team because I started going to a private club. Uh, a gentleman, Mr. Les Fisher had moved to town and he had coached a girl to some fame <laughs> and opened a in, in North Dakota. This, he had moved to South Dakota. And so I started going to his gym. So I would go to school all day and then leave school at two or 2.30 and I would go to the gym and I work out until nine or 10 at night. And I did that for many, many years through, uh, probably from the time I was in eighth or ninth grade all the way through high school. And then I got a scholarship, a small scholarship, but to go to a division school in Minnesota, in Mankato, um, they don't have a gymnastics program anymore, but there were a number of state schools yes. of Minnesota and Wisconsin, North Dakota, South Dakota, Iowa area. So we would travel and do um, meets there. Person who really started me off was the gymnastics coach in junior high, Lucy Linscove. And I get a letter from her every Christmas telling me about what she's doing. And she just turned 80 in December and she's still judging gymnastics in the state of South Dakota. She's kind of an icon, but she, threw three or four of us in her car every summer and took us to gymnastics clinics, took us out to Billings, Montana, Billings, Montana for a week long gymnastics camp. We stayed at her parents' place out on the northwestern part of her, kind of the ranch out on northwestern part of South Dakota. She drove me all over and, and she just kind of took me under her wing. She never married, she never had, had children of her own and there was just a group of us that she kind of raised to become gymnasts. Anyway, I got a letter from her last week and I'm gonna read it to you. It is um, written on these little slips of paper and her writing is a little shaky, but hi, Corey and Ross. I am pretty sure that your mom and dad have probably sent you the article that was on the front page of the Argus Leader some time ago. Your dad had built a replica of the church that he grew up in his hometown. He started the tradition of everyone eventually building churches too to start a tradition on Churchill. I know that he was such a workhorse and was in, in valued himself in the construction of many of the churches. So I'm going to pause right there. And she sent me the article and my mom and dad didn't send it to me. But this is the article that they ran in the in the Sioux Falls, South Dakota newspaper of the churches on Churchill. And I have mentioned that before. And this is the, the church and the parsonage in front of my dad's house. So I grew up on Churchill Avenue. And back in 1966, we moved to this subdivision that was all new homes. So young families, young couples were, and so I, it would have been, me and my first brother, and then I had a second brother living on that. And my dad got together with all the other men in, t uh, in the neighborhood and they built these churches to represent the church where he grew up in Long Lake, South Dakota, which was um, where they lived on the farm. And then they would take the, a horse to town to go to church. My dad did not speak English outside of the home until he went to kindergarten. And um, so it was just, like a, a memory that they still have these churches on Churchill and in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, that is a thing that I've talked about before. Candy Cane Lane, Santa Claus Lane, Reindeer Lane, Churchill Lane Avenue. People drive, they take an evening. A lot of times they'll get a limousine or a bus and hot chocolate on a snowy winter night. And then you drive to the street and then you turn your lights off and then you go down the street really slowly and you look at each of the houses that are decorated for Christmas. So Lucy saw that and thought, you know, I, she sent it to me, which was just so sweet of her. And then she said, your folks my, and myself and Lois Beckstrand were at the George Boom Funeral Home with Carolyn, Roxy, and Coco were greeting guests. A friend of mine from middle school's dad died um, recently and my parents went over to drop off a card and the um, 
my mom told me that Carolyn, and they lived probably four blocks away from me growing up, um, so kind of still in my neighborhood, and the girls were outside, and so they got to say hello, and apparently Lucy walked up, and so it became kind of a, a moment there. And then she said, my 2021 note to everyone will start rolling out as soon as I have taken a couple more pictures. I have a lot of pictures this year because I turned 80 on December 2nd. I am still judging gymnastics and enjoying myself. Just me, Lucy. Just such a nice note to get from a high school coach. Middle school was, um, for me, it was 7th, 8th, and ninth grade, so it was called junior high. But she still um, goes into the pancake house where my nephews work, and she's a talker, so she'll talk to them and tell them stories about... Um, me and <laughs> when I was younger and um, yeah because they both work at the pancake house on the weekends making money for college and things and so it was just such a nice note and a, a, a nice memory this week to still be in touch my high school coach was in a um, a really serious car accident when I was in college and she was in a, a nursing home in a in a not very good state Ever after that so I, I never got to really keep in touch with her that well um, after that and then I have kept in touch with my collegiate gymnastics coach I do get a Christmas card from her every year at the Erdman um, and uh, and so it it's just a part of my life that was so prominent for so long I will say I always thought I was gonna be an Olympic gymnast but Olympic gymnasts don't come out of South Dakota <laughs> I mean, they could, but back in the day, you had to be in one of the more major metropolitan areas to be getting the kind of training at a younger age that I didn't start getting until I was probably 13-ish. You know, I was getting beyond. Um, but I always thought that that would be my, you know, my calling. I got to do all these wonderful things and travel to all these beautiful places and we went to Madison Square Gardens for the American Cup with my high school coach and she took us all on a plane and and I mean I just got such wonderful opportunities so thank you to the teachers right I think probably one of the reasons I became a high school teacher is because if I told you guys that story I couldn't decide what I wanted to go into when I went to college because what I really wanted to go into was gymnastics I mean that was the reason I went to college it wasn't really to get a degree, it was to do gymnastics. And uh, so I talked to a girl outside a hall one day and she was majoring in mass communications. And I didn't even know what that meant in 1982, maybe. And she explained that it was about journalism and there was, you know, you could go into magazine journalism or newspaper journalism or television journalism or radio journalism. And so I took a introduction to mass communications class and I said, Mom and Dad, I'm gonna get my degree in journalism. And my mom, in all her infinite wisdom said, well, you better pick up your teaching license because you're gonna come back to South Dakota and move to a small town and they might not have a newspaper, but they'll have a school. And so I did. I stayed in college for an extra year, got a degree in English, got a degree in journalism, and got a degree in secondary education just in case I had to move back to South Dakota and live in a small town so I could be a teacher. You know, I, I think when you grow up in a really rural state, your expectations for moving out and up and on. Um, and then I met my husband um, when I was at college and he got an internship in the Twin Cities, Minneapolis and St. Paul. And he moved up here and I was still in college. He got done early. He graduated in less than four years and got this internship. And then I couldn't get it, find a teaching job because I had no experience. So I ended up in that small town of Minnesota teaching. And I, I interviewed for journalism jobs, but I couldn't find one. And then I, when I student taught my fifth year of college to stay I, to do that, the, the light and the passion just went on. That was really my calling being a teacher and working with kids so yeah i don't know that i've ever got <laughs> told you guys that story about my mom saying you're going to end up back here in south dakota <laughs> there's not going to be a newspaper in the town but there will be a school and so i student taught with a wonderful teacher in mankato and 
Yeah. And then I ended up going to Edgerton, Minnesota for two years, which is a small town down in the southwest corner of the state, about an hour from Sioux Falls, my hometown. Oh, it's garbage truck day. So yeah, I taught in Edgerton, Minnesota, and I was the 7th, 8th, 9th, 10th, 11th, and 12th grade English teacher. And when I got there, I also did the school play, the school newspaper, the yearbook, and the cheerleaders. Because you're the only teacher in town and you're young and energetic. And I went to class, you know, to teacher workshop the first week and I'm sitting in the library, in the elementary school library, I'm not sure why, but we were sitting on these small chairs, if I remember right. Across the table from me was another first year, first time young teacher. And she looked at me and I said, oh, I'm so glad you're here. <laughs> and she said, yeah, me too. She said, I had to move into a mobile home trailer over in, and I got mice. And I said, oh, I took the last apartment and there was a eight plex apartment building, government subsidized in this town. I don't know how that ever happened. And it was a two bedroom apartment and it was the only place left to live in town. And she apparently hadn't been hired yet. So I rented that and I said, I have two bedrooms. Do you want to move in? move in with me. So Julie moved, packed up her stuff and moved out of the mouse infested, you know, trailer that she was living in. And uh, other, it was either that or get a cat, I think. And she, and the principal and the moved us, he got his pickup truck and moved her up. And then we lived together for two years and we're still friends to this day. But yeah, she, she was an elementary special ed teacher and she helped me with cheerleaders and we all did all the things. Like you had to help take tickets and the cheerleaders had to march in the band at halftime because there weren't enough band members if the cheerleaders didn't participate. And so, you know, and the cheerleaders also were playing volleyball in the fall season and so they would have volleyball matches. Everybody did everything to try to, you know, participate in this small Christian Reformed community. So it was um, Dutch Reformed and there was a private school in the town, a Christian Reformed um, school that kids went to as well. So that's one of the reasons that the high school was so small is because half the children, the kids in this town went to the private school if you were uh, Christian Reformed. And then the town whistle went off at, on Wednesday nights and um, to tell you that town, downtown was open until 8 p.m. Otherwise, everything closed when the town was went off at 5. And um, those, the, the prison reform kids all had to go to school on Wednesday nights or to church on Wednesday nights and twice on Sunday. They went to church in the morning and at night. So it was a really interesting place to do my first two years of, of teaching and, and get a lot of experience in a lot of things. And then I moved to... Um, got married and interviewed in, um, well, I got married and then I moved up to Minneapolis, um, moved in with Ross to an apartment and went, took a class. Uh, and I don't know why I signed up for it, but it was a, a couple of day workshop computer training kind of thing, you know, because we're talking 1986 now. So we didn't, not everybody had a computer. We still had a blue mimeograph machine in Edgerton. We ran off our, and the smell of that stuff, you would stand there and then run off your ditto copies where you do it in carbon paper. And so I took this class and there were women from Wyzetta High School in this class and they told me that there was a position open for an at-risk English teacher. And I said, I have no experience with at-risk students, but I can learn. And I went to that interview and I don't know that they had many people interviewing to work with at-risk kids. The principal of that interview called me just hours after I got home and she said, I wanna offer you the position and I need you to take it because I wanna go on vacation tomorrow. <laughs> and I said, I'll take it. And she said, you gotta go to at-risk training for the rest of the summer, right? To work with these kids, we're gonna send you to, you gotta sign up for, and I said, okay. <laughs> My eyes were, you know, this big and ended up teaching at-risk kids for 17 years because they became just really my passion in working with kids who struggled in school and struggled in life and yeah and then they came knocking at the door a year later and said we hear you used to coach cheerleaders and that's how I became a cheerleading coach at Wyzetta for 10 years so there you go there's your Corey story for the day a rambling long meander through my past. 
I have lots of hellos today. So I have um, hellos from episode 64, which was the one before the WIP podcast last week, which I'm going to talk about as well. But hello to Christina Kay, Victoria Pileski, Kath Karen Mezzacapo, Kathy Goodman, who I had a little conversation with this week, a Sharon Deerdorf, Terry Johnson, Danielle Brown, Knit Takes Two Michelle, The N Aisha, Mary B, Luana Hendricks, Suzanne Gates, Judy Muscroft, Cheryl Lacemaker, Patty Sheck, Shady Sue, Jesse's Mom 12, Michelle M, Beth Murray, Aaron Davis, Patty Skaggs, Liz Nava, Lisa Smith, Karen H, Christine Carr, Weaver Woman 2, Christine Lacatus, Jas Conrad, Margarita Deverson, Robin Glasser, no, Robin Gasser, Carolyn Jans, Mom 2 Profits, Pat Kohler, Joanne Goldenberg, Carrie Walden, Sally Conrad, Suzanne Singh, Leslie Arnold Hopkins, Terry Monk, Olivia Mankey, Peggy Bork, Quilting Chap, Bonnie Glass, Meg Carr, Helen Henry, Sherry Palmer, who said interruptions means you have a full life. I had talked to you guys about how I get interrupted and today Ross has come down and left and then come back and the garbage truck has come and I had to put Cody in the garage and she said that means you live a full life and I agree. And Kelly Mathern got in touch and said that the recipe story made her tear up and she's the one who made the recipe for me many years ago when I had my first knee replacement. So that was really nice to hear from you, Kelly. And Betty Stein and Nancy Willick, who told me that I should probably do my podcasts live if I don't like doing the editing, if they're getting too long. And that is a great idea. But when you do a live podcast, you have to be um, uninterrupted and you have to really be careful about your words and that you don't say things um, that are inappropriate or um, might be misconstrued. And I have a little uh, fear about that, but I have done a live podcast since she um, put that little bug in my ear. I did an Instagram live. So if you have That's, that is in my, under the little television on my Instagram page. And I did a little chat one Friday. So you might want to take a look at that. And thanks for giving me the little push in the pants there, Nancy. Takes a little bit more to do something live and not mess up in front of people. Not that I care if I, I mess up, but I, um, I can have a little bit of a potty mouth. I, I, I taught at risk kids and heard swearing for 17 years and sometimes I can let let it fly and that would be inappropriate for you to all listen to <laughs> okay Diana Barnes Janet Holler who along with several other of you had comments about the Rodham book and there were I was not the only one that got a little scammed by that book that I talked about Susie Fab Pat Howe's World Peace She's got the podcast, uh, that's Marie. Uh, Melissa Pizarro, Crochet Creations by Christy, Candy Harris, Alien Mom 415, Jess Make a Knit, Melinda Zaccardi Rousseau, Beraria, Eileen Tamero, Who Made the Shepherd's Pie, which is always nice to hear when you guys make things, Denise Norber, Heather Wilson, Carol Childers, who commented on the new graphics right away when that podcast went up and said, I love the new graphics. Marty I, Teresa Severia, Misty Blue, Brandy Stoker, who made the cheesy spread from right before Christmas and said that it was delicious. Christina F, who is brand new to the podcast. Can you guys believe that there are still people who almost every week reach out and say, I just found your podcast and now I'm going to go back. I'm just going to warn you, Christina, that you should not go back 65 episodes and watch them all in a row. You will get Corey fatigue. <laughs> Glenda Bathgate, Krista Lowe, who is one of the persons who told me that I said knit it with lamb, uh, Michelle Marie 885, Maggie Two Sticks, who said turtlenecks are all are not out, and a lot of you commented on my turtleneck concept. I have a little turtleneck on today. Here's the deal: 24-year-old opinionated daughters do not wear turtlenecks. And they tell their mother that they do not wear turtlenecks because they're not really in fashion. That does not mean that you cannot all wear turtlenecks or that I cannot wear a turtleneck. But I had some turtlenecks that were getting pretty worn 
and I needed to purge some of those in order to perhaps bring a new one into the fold. But some of you were a little like, turtle legs, I, well, yes, we live, if we live in cold climates, for sure, you can keep your turtle legs. Don't listen to me, you know, give you an opinion of my daughter saying turtlenecks or not. And I don't think young people are probably wearing turtlenecks right now. Maybe a mock turtleneck, but not a big fold over sweater type. Um, I don't even know how to explain it. Mine were not sweater, almost like uh, cotton, you know, polyester, whatever. Some of them needed to go. I took her um, opinion with a grain of salt, but also got rid of some stuff that probably needed to get out of the closet. Don't we all have stuff in our closet that we probably shouldn't be wearing anymore, but we still really like it. You do you. Janet Robertson, Pat Wagner, who commented on extroverts and introverts when I was telling that I live with two introverts. And so that was fun to have that conversation. Kathy B, Victoria Nitz, Angela Jenkins, Carol Morrison, who asked me if the pump up the plaid blanket is washable. No. If you knit the pump up the plaid blanket with 100% wool, it is not machine wash and dryable. Although I'm not sure any of you would machine wash and dry that plaid blanket after you've woven it anyway. But if you need it to be machine washable, then you probably need to use an acrylic fiber of some kind. I have never washed mine. If it got dirty, I would spot clean it or um, wash it by hand or wash it in the gentle cycle to see how it how it did. I might even knit a swatch and weave a piece of yarn through it and wash that first. And I should probably do that to let you all know. So if I think of it, I'll do that this week and I'll let you know. Stephanie Haberman, Regina Hobbs, and RYO Knit. Those are all the people that commented on episode 64 and you guys love the plaid blanket. I had such great success with the plaid blanket. And it was just such a shocking revelation to me because literally that pattern had been out on Ravelry for free for 10 years. And it just sat there and no one knit it and there were no projects. But because the picture was just the orange, blue, green, and pink, or um, one, purple one, that I laid on the floor and took a picture and, and just slapped it on there, it didn't generate any you know people probably weren't googling it was called woven plaid blanket <laughs> and i rewrote it and added another size to it but i did have a couple of people get in touch and say is this the same blanket that i have in my library because i took it as a free pattern and i said yes and as soon as they purchased the new pattern the old one went away because the new one is a checklist pattern it's got you know a lot more information in it. The first one was shoddily written, <laughs> but I just wasn't expecting so many people to like that. Amber um, Lindemann, the Yarn Hoarder of the Yarn Hoarder podcast, and I think she's going to record this week, um, is going to have a knit along with that blanket, um, apparently. She ordered yarn from Brown Sheep, and she ordered white, and it is back ordered. So she's kind of put the brakes on that because other people probably are also waiting too. I think it's about a, a week or two before they'll have that yarn out to everyone. And so she's going to make an announcement and, and do a knit along for that. So I'm, I'm thankful that she wants to do that. Um, okay, and then... So many of you were so surprised by my whip um, confessions video from last week that I posted. You know, I was just sitting here that day editing and I, I wanted to go through those bags over the weekend. And I often either podcast on Sunday or Monday, and then I have the day to edit and get things done. And I thought, I really didn't get that done. I want to go through those. Maybe I should just record it. And it was fun. It was really fun. And so many of you cried with me when they when we read the card, my anniversary card from my husband that I pulled out of that bag. And you know what? I put it back in there. I thought that is going to be a memory. Whenever I open that bag, that's going to be in there. But I did have a number of people say that I don't have that many project bags to hang on a tree. And I, I agree, right? Like I've collected project bags over the years. I've been knitting for many years and I, it's probably been, mm, we were on a shop hop the first time I saw 
a cute box bag project bag with knitting chickens on it and a lady walked by and I stopped her and I said that is the cutest bag and she said oh it's a box bag it's a project bag for your knitting and I had never heard or seen a project bag for knitting and so she gave me the name of the place and I ordered it and it, I probably still have it in the closet but I mean that's probably been at least 15 years ago so if you buy a bag every year you have 15 bags easily right and I, I've gotten bags for gifts and Matt makes bags and my friend Renee made, make, made bags for a while. So then I bought all those bags. But you don't have to have project bags to have a project bag tree or to organize your whips in that way, right? You could certainly use those um, shoe bags that, you know, that shoes come in, um, the cloth ones or the plastic ones. You could use uh, gift bags. You could use grocery bags with... Um, handles on them to hang on the hooks of a you know put a project in each one or have your kids decorate you know white gift bags or brown gift bags and color on them and and have them draw a picture of what you're making on the outside as a craft and hang it on a tree or stack it in a tub or make it I bought a new cart this week I'll put a picture in here of my my new cart that I put all the things that were works in progress that were small that could be finished quickly on the cart in their project bag and then I left the bigger projects like the big sweaters that right now I probably can't knit on and you know manage and the designs are on the tree and the tree is still sitting here because we haven't moved it out of this room back to the the office so um, they're just still sitting here on this tree but you know, you don't have to have special project bags just to organize your whips. Some of you were really offended by the number of whips I have, and it doesn't bother me in the least. I have no qualms about the fact that I have lots of things on the needle. My favorite part of knitting is casting on. There are evenings where I will just cast on three things because it's all I want to do. I love casting on. I love figuring out what I'm going to knit, figuring out the yarn, what I'm going to do, what size I'm going to make, and casting on. And a lot of times in a project bag, it didn't happen this time much. I just had that one design that has the cast on and like two rows in it. Those are in my project bags a lot. It gets me started so that then if I need to grab and go, I it's something's already started. And I can look at it and say, oh, this hat's been cast on. It's already started. It can go with me. But I did find a couple of other whips in my life. So if you were offended, <laughs> you'll be even more offended. I have a project in my car at all times for getting stuck in your car, emergencies, driving across town, whatever. And it is in a Christmas Grinch Christmas bag right now. And it is leg warmers. Um, Amber and I bought self or sock striping worsted weight yarn in dark green, lime green, pink, I'll, I'll put a picture, um, and that's in my car, and I'm knitting it a magic loop. I never knit magic loop, so it's my magic loop practice to just kind of keep that skill of being able to teach magic loop to people because it's just not something that I do all the time, and so it's, it, it, that's, that one's in the car. <laughs> then I got out a couple of new things and cast them on and finished them, uh, uh, well, a bulky cowl because I'm finding that bulky weight yarn and big needles is makes my hands happy right now. I don't I don't have any pain with that, so I cast on a, a cowl and made a matching making. I'm working on making a matching hat, so I'm going to make a couple of videos this afternoon because someone asked me um, this week, and I think it's in these hellos. So I think I'll do the hellos from the Whip podcast here. Angela Jenkins, who teared up with me with my husband's anniversary card. Trent, Trenty Miller, Rochelle in Seattle, Cheryl Lacemaker, Karen Tomlin, Jan Janet Holler, Joanne Crate, Heather Wilson, Red Jewel 18, Terry Monk, a mom in Arkansas 2, Luana Hendricks, Heather Anderson, Olivia Menke, Mary B, L. Friedman, Pat Howes, The N. Aisha, and she commented that she has the same what stopped me instinct, right? Like you can open a bag and take it out and go, I know why I stopped working on this. This is the thing that caused me the problem. And so I could no longer work on it anymore. And I thought that was interesting that, you know, she has whips that have that same, they had an issue, they got set aside for that reason. So thanks for sharing that. Tammy Samborski, Janet Goyer, Pat 
Kaler, Annette Swerks, Mary Case, Kathy Bertel, Alien Mom 415, Liza Kingston Coleman, Joy Yusuf, Yusuf Zay, Yusuf Zay, am I saying that right? Yeah, I think that's right. Will you let me know, Joy? Judith Musgrove, Bonnie Glass, Janet Robertson, Gwyneth Hill, Essie Wilhite, Jill Jackson, who has a broken arm, and Jill... I feel for you. If you can't knit right now, boy, it stinks if you're a knitter and you are watching TV in the winter at night and you can't knit. <laughs> so I'm thinking of you. Cindy Buchheit, Karen Eisenbach, who got herself a haul tree right away after that last podcast where I showed my haul tree. Thanks for letting me know, Karen, that you, you know, you saw use for it. And someone else bought two. One for coats for kids and one, one for knitting projects. Um, and there are lots of options out there at different price points um, on Amazon and on in different furniture stores. So um, Denise Norber, Andrea Rivera, Gail S., Glenda Bathgate, Margarita Deverson, Patty Best, Carolyn Jans, Kathy B., Brandy Stoker, Karen H., who said you have all the project bags, which I do. <laughs> uh, Sighthounds Galore, who did share that that is a dog. Um, rescue situation. Eileen Tamayro, who was exhausted after my last podcast, Eileen. I got really energized. I love looking at my knitting and having all the different projects um, on my tray right now. I just have all the projects and I, I sit down and I think, oh, what am I going to work on next? So it doesn't exhaust me at all to have so many, but I'm sorry it did you. Um, Jesse's Mom 12, Kathy Goodman, Holly Sharp, Jennifer Page, Susie White, Stephanie Haberman, Twinset Ellen. Hi, Ellen. Candy Harris, Jennifer Layton, who asked me if I could point her to the video where I talked about knitting with a mini skein around my neck. Um, and just knitting off the mini skein after I talked about the sock, crazy sock lady having that board. And it is on episode 10 at minute 4343. 43. I looked it up, but I, this is not the first time someone's asked me for that. So today following this podcast, I will be recording a separate video for how to knit with a mini skein around your neck and putting it up on YouTube too. It'll probably be a, you know, one minute, two minute of how I do it and I'll just get my blanket out and I'll just show it but that way it will be more easily accessible for people to just find it as a tutorial as opposed to going back and me having to go back and find it because I had to go back and look and it just took me a few minutes and then Rachel Weisenstein who has her own podcast which some of you watch but yes you need to share your whips too and Karen Frankauer who asked me about the flower yoke sweater that I showed in the last podcast that I was going to knit on the top of that brown bottom that I have already knit that was going to be for my dad or my husband because it was brown, but then I decided that I needed the sweater. <laughs> it should be a sweater for me, but I, you know, brown's not really my cover, but color, but with that yoke. And it's the Sun Drop sweater by Langsrud. Her last name is Langsrud, but I said Moon Drop apparently. It, it confused Karen. So I, I I did go back and I apologize for that. I said moon drop and it was sun drop. And I put it in the show notes as sun drop. So you can always look in the bar down below this for the show notes or go to the Ravelry page where I have the show notes and all the links to everything I talk about. And Kat Montgomery and Sarah D are a little worried about my me time knitting. They're concerned that I'm not spending enough time knitting for myself. You guys, I have been knitting for myself for 30 some years. There is no, you know, I am not <laughs> disturbed at all by the fact that I'm doing design work uh, all day, every day, and into the evenings every night, and that I spend my weekends doing design work and I'm on the computer all the time. It, it brings me joy and knitting is knitting. So if I'm knitting, you know, on this to make another prototype set or this, it, it's all knitting, it's design work, but then I don't always have to do it either. Sometimes I can ship it out and say, hey, I knit the prototype, I knit the one for the picture, I need someone to knit someone for knit it for this yarn store who wants to feature it. And then I don't feel like I have to knit that. So I do have sample knitters and test knitters for that reason that I don't have to continually knit the same thing over and over again, but I 
it was really sweet that they're like, you need to take 30 minutes a night for, or a day for yourself, or you need to set aside two nights a week where you could knit for yourself. It's all good. Like literally my husband is a great kitchen cleaner upper. So from 6.30 to 7ish, I can walk to the dining, to, from the, where we eat in the kitchen over there, walk to my chair and be there until 1 a.m. knitting. Like, I'm not knitting that whole time right now because of my hands, but you guys, I get to knit. I get to knit a lot. I knit on our way out to dinner last night. Oh, you guys, we ate in an igloo last night. I'll put a picture in. It was really fun. They, you know, all over the U.S., they have tried to come up with ways to for you know restaurants to stay open or reopen so that people can gather but they are limiting the number of people in the restaurant so they've got these plastic igloos they're really made with like pvc white pvc and hooked together and then plastic stretched over the top ours literally had like white sandbags all the way around the outside holding it down so it wouldn't blow away in like minnesota wind and it never got toasty warm in there like it wasn't 70 degrees in there uh, they had a little space heater in there and you had blankets on the back of your chair so you could pull a blanket around your but it, it did warm up once we were in there and we you know we took our coat off we didn't have to eat in our coat or whatever and if you had a sweater on you were fine i i don't know how cold it was it was i just i don't have a good judge of character it, it was maybe 60 degrees in there or something like that and then, you know, you have warm food and you have drinks or whatever. It was just really fun. And this particular restaurant is in a nice part of the Twin Cities with, it's a more expensive hotel. And they took a couple of their hotel rooms and took the beds out and put a table in so that they could seat people like in a private dining room. You have to spend a certain amount if you get a, an igloo or one of those rooms. You have to promise to, you know, not have an appetizer and then leave. Um, so you, yeah. there's an upfront kind of deposit. But, you know, people are getting creative for ways. We hadn't been out to dinner in months and months. And we had, you know, this opportunity. And it was, it was really fun. The service was terrible. <laughs> really slow. Because they have to... Leave your igloo, go down to the corner, go up the front steps into the restaurant, back to the thing, get your spoon, bring it back. And she was, I don't know, very nice. I liked her. I'm always nice, but it was really slow. She didn't come back for a while, and I was like, we got to work on how we're going to make this. Like, she needed a walkie-talkie or a phone to call the kitchen and say, hey, I just dropped all the silverware, and I've just given them their food, and they don't have any silverware or I need a water out here whatever because she did have people help her bring out the food I don't know <laughs> it was an interesting experience I thought I should share it with you all um okay anyway the last person on that list is Danielle Brown and I don't know if I said your name Danielle but thank you all for commenting I know that was a lot this week but I, d I forgot to do hellos on the last podcast, and I do like mentioning what we're talking about. And if you don't read all everyone else's comments in the YouTube, that's absolutely fine. But I read them all, and I liked, and some of you comment on one another's. So it's kind of fun to, to have that interaction. All right. My phone just went off. That means I've got other things to do today. I am going to the shoulder doctor to get an injection in my right shoulder. I haven't had one for about 18 months. That is also a previous gymnastics injury. And I'm gonna ask him about it. Um, see if I can um, sleep on my right side. That's my preferred sleeping side. And I can't do it right now and I get in the night. I have good range of motion. I can't go up here. Yeah, I can't do that. So get a little injection in there maybe today we'll see maybe not maybe he'll say no nope, no more injections and and I need to probably get some physical therapy done on it and and do some ice and that kind of thing because this is my you know my right hand that I just had done so I wasn't moving it for a long time and anyway if it's not one thing it's the other right you have you had a gymnastics career so now you have a gymnastics body and then you have a mother with severe arthritis and you got a little bit of that too 
I'm okay. I do most of my day sitting. I'm just looking around to make sure that I didn't miss anything. Until next time, waddle on, no green bananas. Don't complain with your mouth full. I don't always remember to say that one, but my mouth is full and so no complaining here, right? I, I Things are going okay, I'm staying safe. I have a warm house and a partner that I love living with and sharing my day to day with because I'm not sharing it with anybody else and as an extrovert, I'd really like to talk to someone who's not an introvert every day, but it's a, it's good, he's, he's good. I have to jab him a little every now and then to get him to have a conversation, but that's okay. You'll never regret ripping back. Keep your fork. Keep it colorful, everybody, and I'll see you in two weeks.